This is the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about the Invincible Adam Eve special. And where have you been? Adam, wait. Don't stick up for her. She's late for her own birthday. You couldn't even call. Did you eat my cake? How dare you! I need to go. Go? Go where? Hey, like it or not, we're the only family you've got. Welcome back, Guardians, or should I say Adamites, to the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industry. Yes, I am Chris, and we're talking about the Invincible special that was all centred on Adam Eve. So we can call it the Invincible Adam Eve special. As I said, I am one of your hosts, Chris, and I am joined by the delectable, the despicable, the deranged, the director-in-chief. Derek. Quadruple D, Chris. Yes, yeah. I'm your other co-host, Derek. Yes, uh, we are continuing our coverage of Invincible by going back before the start of season two uh, to talk about the Atom Eve special. Yes. Well, we, we're ending our part one of season two kind of review. Mm-hmm. So they, as we, if you haven't, if you're just listening to this Atom Eve special, we've covered the first four episodes that were released of season two. And we thought this would be a nice bookend just to kind of give us that, hey, we're now at the halfway point. We're going to wait to some point early 2024 Mm -hmm. for the part two. That could be January. That could be July. More than likely March or April. But let's see. Uh Maybe we get a May thing. Um, so we thought this would be a nice way just to kind of wrap up some feedback for the season two part one and also really get into what we saw as this, which was a bit of a shock where they just dropped the Adam Eve special on us mm-hmm. during Comic Con. Yeah, it was New York Comic Con, wasn't it? They, they made the yeah. announcement, dropped it, uh, just after that. And we were in the middle of doing three other shows on our main podcast feed on TV podcast industry. So we couldn't fit it in at the time, but we knew we'd get around to it eventually. Yeah. And, uh, it didn't impact season two at all, really. Just a couple of little connections with, uh, with some of the characters that we have in here. So, uh, happy to come back and talk about it now. Yeah. And it's a fun one. It really is. Mm-hmm. It, it gives, it, it's very much like a, a one off, a one shot comic book absolutely in that you don't need to know or read the one shot Mm -hmm. to enjoy the actual main comic book feed but you'll get more out of it if you've watched this if you read the one shot and you kind of see what's happening on the side of a main event so this is the exact same thing don't need to watch it but if you do use as you say you see more about eve her family Mm -hmm her background, and all those fun and games, and even a Mr. Kill slash (laughs) Cannon. Absolutely, yeah. And and some other interesting things, because this all takes place before season one of Invincible as well, which makes it even more interesting. There's loads of things that uh, are touched upon in this episode, which we'll talk about when we get into our detailed spoiler-filled discussion. But if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, uh, you can get access to all of our coverage of all the shows we cover by popping on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com, or you can subscribe on any good or evil podcast catcher. Uh, Just search for TV Podcast Industries and you'll get access to everything. We also want to hear your feedback as well. As always, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can go over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries to kick off this discussion about Invincible. We're actually are going to go backwards. We're going to uh, go through your feedback for season two, episode four, because we recorded a little bit early. Uh, so we have had some feedback in after we sent out our podcast into the podcast verse. Yes. But first, over on the world of Spotify, Conan Dorgan has this to say. It's been a while. It's stained. Not Creed, guys. Same era, though. Love the podcast. Never miss one. Thanks, Conan. Yeah. It was the second time we brought up. It was, it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, on the episode, it's been a while, which was the fourth episode of season two, because I like saying, it's been a while. I thought it was Creed at the end of episode three. Mm-hmm. We just went with it because really, it 
that whole era is a blur of music. <laughs> a lot of it was good. A lot of it was not so good. Uh -huh. Some of it was just stained and creed. <laughs> <laughs> And to be honest, I think we were an hour and a half into our recording session that night. Uh, normally, we'd stop and Google things if we don't know them for definite, and we didn't decide to do that. But we did do it in time for the uh, the finale of the series. So, uh, But I did want to uh, put that into our feedback because it's great to hear from me on Spotify. If anybody wants to send us feedback over on Spotify, there's a little uh, button that you can do on Spotify where you can send any feedback into us. So it's also, also great to hear that you're listening to all of our episodes of the podcast too. Yes. Thank you so much, Conan. But yes, let's go on to our feedback all the way to episode four of season two, Invincible. Follow me in the Wayne's World style. Diddly, 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 diddly. Yes, we're going back in time and we're going back to feedback for episode four. Absolutely. First up, we got an email in from Coffee and Vodka who says, Greetings, fellow bug bomb defenders. I did not see any of that coming. From Adam Eve's fatal failure to Debbie finding her strength so quickly, to Nolan's hero turn, to Mark's new job as conqueror. So much everything happening on top of the next, complete with character growth, tragedy, and so much blood. Is Donald a clone or just semi-indestructible? Is Mark's half-brother alive? Is Omni-Man going to be executed or become a catalyst for the next Viltrumite civil war? It was great to see Indestructible live up to his name for a short time, though sorry, sorry it took genocide to bring it out. Yet, even with so much going on, my big blue favourites were there to top the episode with one last murderous surprise. This has been one wild ride, and the second half of this season cannot come soon enough. 4.5 bloody bent blades, artful pep talks, and deadly dads out of five. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. Thanks, coffee and vodka. Do you know what? You should write some scripts for the end. Do you remember those old, in the old Batman ones, where it's at the end of the episode, it would be like, how will Batman get from this? Will the Riddler get away with it? Mm -hmm. Will Omni-Man survive and be e or executed? Will he become the catalyst for the next Vulture Civil War? Tune in next week, Guardians, to find out. Same invincible time, same invincible channel, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Be happy to close out. Excellent. Yes, that'd be great. <laughs> good stuff, Coffee and Vodka. Yeah, some, some great thoughts there. Uh, this has just been, has been such a good season, uh, building up to that uh, kind of cliffhanger in, in episode four uh, to see where these characters are going to go in the next half of the season. Uh, but there's so much in every episode of this show. It's, it's yeah. so interesting. Uh, they don't just stick in one storyline and do 20 minutes on it. Uh, they do a full hour and stick in loads and loads of things and potentials uh, for these characters coming up in the future. So, yeah, really cool um is donald a clone or just semi-indestructible don't know um i've no idea yet uh, i guess we'll see uh, in the next half of the season only time will tell exactly exactly thanks coffee and vodka voice. i love that voice thanks coffee and vodka <laughs> i will be using that from now on <laughs> no i won't no i won't i will not subject our listeners to that maybe just once in the future but let's pop on over to Facebook, where we had this feedback from Joel Sharpton, who had this to say. Maybe the best single episode yet. Ooh. This one was a thrill ride from top to bottom, and significantly advanced several overall se series arcs as well. I dread the Vulturemites, but we need them for the overall series arc to advance. This episode gave a great balance of some small character moments, especially with Debbie, Donald and Eve while having serious action sequences too. Mm -hmm. The moment Donald started investigating Debbie's surprise, I knew he was going to end the episode with a knife in his arm. That's the number one android trope. Nice. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, it's definitely a trope. Now, we will say, this show, this property, was built to subvert tropes mm -hmm. literally there is the avengers style group there is your superman style group that it literally in the comic book started as your typical comic booky superhero comic book mm -hmm. in the episode one of the season of season one it started as your typical kind of thing that's it, the whole thing is subverting tropes so i'm not saying you're wrong i'm not saying you're right i'm just saying Food for thought. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think obviously the most famous of those is uh, is Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator, uh, putting a knife into his arm and showing off uh, the mechanisms inside. It didn't really see the mechanisms inside uh, Donald's arm. We just saw 
the uh, the bent blade of the uh, mm-hmm. of the knife that he used. So we'll see. Again, uh, interesting story. I know uh, I've been listening to lots of podcasts about Invincible uh, since these episodes have come out, and uh, lots and lots of Invincible comic book readers don't really remember the story around Donald because it's so early on in the comic series. So uh, <laughs> so that's quite interesting. Not many people know exactly what's going on with Donald. Uh, some people have had to go back and reread uh, those bits. So it'll be interesting to see how to do it in the show. It might be something brand new for the show as well. I mean, you never know with uh, with anything belonging to Robert Kirk and what he's going to do with these characters. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the best one I've heard is people going, he's like Wolverine. They've just given him a, like, a, like an adamantium skeleton. Okay. And he like grows back everything. For front. And I was like, that's pretty cool. But that would be a cool thing. It might like, be. Might be. Like we've se- we've only seen like one other person do that. And that was Wolverine where he like, we grew from like an atomic bomb or something mm-hmm. going off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, let's wait and see. You never know. Brand new thoughts after, uh, what's it? 14 years or so since the yeah. original comic came out. Uh, something like uh, that so about that yeah yeah something like that great stuff thanks for your thoughts Joel also over on Facebook we got David Mr. Reiter's thoughts he says okay so does Mark ever win a fight because every single season I've just seen him get beat over and over and over again the invincible title doesn't suit him the ongoing Clone War side quest is also hilarious and whoever said Homelander would beat a Viltrumite was a goddamn liar <laughs> You're damn right. Yes, uh, they're they're definitely wrong about that. Uh, Homelander could not beat a Viltrumite. They're way too powerful. Homelander has a very specific set of very powerful skills, but uh, Viltrumites would overpower him pretty quickly, I'd say, if there was ever a kind of crossover uh, going on between them. Uh, the Invincible title, I, I think I actually talked to uh, to David about this over on uh, on Facebook, but the Invincible title is actually ironic. That's kind of the joke about it. He's got superpowers. He is invincible. He doesn't die from being beaten up all the time. But the joke of it is that he does get beaten up all the time because he doesn't have any training or anything like that at all. So he is invincible. He doesn't get beaten up. But um, yeah, it it is a bit of a joke. He's not a superhero in the traditional sense. He just thinks he is because he's super powered. (laughs) But he is also... Sorry, that's where you're supposed to flash. Like, if this was a video podcast, I'd just put up the splash card <laughs> with Invincible. For for me, uh, everything just froze, and I just saw Chris's yeah. hand uh, on my on my screen. So uh, I, yeah. I, I I was just like, "Hey, <laughs> high five. Doesn't work for an audio podcast, Chris. No, unfortunately, it really doesn't. It no, it doesn't. Uh, but the other thing, of course, to point out, which we which we got into in our discussion about this in our Facebook group, um. We haven't even reached about issue 30 or 35 of the comic. We're somewhere around the mid-20s of the comic book and the story arcs that are in there. Some things are moved around a little bit, of course, but uh, there's 144 issues in this series. So um, lots and lots of story to cover uh, as we get, uh, as the story goes on, as these seasons go on. So, uh, But we're not even close to there yet. So whatever ha- is happening right now with Mark as Invincible, uh, that could all change as the show continues. Yep. Thanks so much, David. We also have some feedback from Dr. Bob Phillips, who had this to say. Well, I wasn't expecting... Actually, I can't start every review with that, but I wasn't. Omniman is actually a hero. Mark nearly won a fight against a Voltamite with weaponized ponytail. <laughs> Donald might be a character, not a specter. And there's a half-brother? Adam Eve adding more to the collateral damage total was probably the only predictable part. Enjoyed it hugely. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Yeah, the weaponized ponytail. I always like that one. That's like a, like a fun thing. Like you've seen in like Mortal Kombat and stuff like that. And you've <laughs> yeah. seen, but it's like, yeah, if you're going to have a ponytail, that's like a, t- or something hanging off you, mm-hmm. like a cape, you might as well weaponize it because otherwise you're going to get yanked on it. Absolutely. No, it's very cool that the, the dagger that's basically in the bottom of a ponytail is, uh, looks really, um, really painful. Uh, and used to a great effect, uh, in the episode as well. And um, the half brother we haven't mentioned, um, the half brother of of Mark in here. Um, we think that he's safe. I think uh, Joel asked that question. Well, we think yeah. he and and uh, her mother is her mother is safe uh, in that cave that Mark put them into. But um, that wasn't really it. Didn't go into it at all in the episode. Um, but I suppose if they didn't go into it, I guess we're going to see them again in the future, right? Uh, it didn't die on screen, uh, unlike a hundred thousand other. Uh, other members of their planet. So uh, I presume we are going to see Mark's half brother again in the future. You'd assume so. Yeah. You'd assume so. Like they're, they're introducing a major, a, a major plot point for one and a half episodes. Mm-hmm. Not even like, I think it, it makes sense to kind of bring them back 
not killing them off screen. An off screen death is usually like kept for I don't know, like secondary B less characters, not like pivotal moments in character yeah. arcs. Okay. But it's invincible. They may book a trend. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Or, well, it was reserved for the hundreds and thousands of, of, uh, of Thraxans that were on the planet uh, that were killed yes. off screen, right? So, uh, so I presume not the two of them. As for Omni Man being actually a hero, mm -hmm. he did something heroic, certainly, saving the people uh, from Thraxa, including his now wife. Um, but they all have very short lifespans, and he seemed really, really annoyed that he cared about them and cared about their lives and is kind of blaming Mark for making him care about them. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's all still there with, with Omni-Man. He is going against his kind of, uh, not programming, but he's going against his people in the choices that he's making, but he's still kind of fighting against it. So that's uh, that seems to be his, um, his own turmoil, I suppose, uh, as a character. Yeah. But I don't know whether I'd call him a hero yet. How how many good deeds make you a hero? I think how many bad how many good deeds do you need to do for the millions of bad things you've already done? Yeah, I think. Well, when what is the redemptive arc there? Yeah, I think oh. murdering all those people in Chicago um, and telling Mark none of them meant anything to him and still not apologizing for it uh, or doing yeah. anything to make up for it probably um, means he hasn't done any kind of redemptive arc yet. <laughs> Uh, he all. stared into a black hole yeah. and the black hole stared back yep, and almost allowed it to kill him yeah yeah but that was <laughs> almost <laughs> <laughs> good stuff uh, thanks dr bob uh, one final piece of feedback on last week's episode from richard blaze who says what an episode to be fair this whole run of four episodes has been great Good stuff, Richard. Glad you've been enjoying the season as well and hope you've been enjoying the podcasts alongside it uh, as usual yep thanks so much uh it was it has been and i think we as we kind of went through each episode, we even additionally said it ourselves, Rich, we, we kind of went, this was just all good. There was, it was all killer, no filler, really. <laughs> and I'm, I'm down with that. Absolutely. Uh, really looking forward to getting back to the second half of the season. But before that, we are going to be discussing the Atom Eve special. Yes, we are. But thank you everyone for your feedback. It is now time to transition back Wayne World style into our main regular schedule programming, the Atom Eve special of Invincible. Diddly -doo, diddly -doo, diddly -doo, diddly -doo. Yes, we are back. I hope you enjoyed that interlude back into the past or the future, depending on when you are listening to this and where you are in the overall kind of season two malarkey that is the release schedule. Adam Eve came out first, second Part one came out with four episodes. Part two, are you listening to, are you in the future? Is it 2024 yet? Have the aliens come? Did Elon Musk destroy X? I mean, Twitter. I mean, X. I, is it still called that? Who knows? But you know what we do know? We have a great episode to discuss. Yes, Derek, do you want to tell us who gave us what, where, when, and how with the episode details for this Adam Eve special of Invincible? He's gone off the reservation, listeners. Yeah. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what happened. It's not just caffeine in the Coke Zero. There's, it's old school. It, it's the old school <laughs> recipe. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to how to respond to that. Yes, let's get into the details about this episode of Invincible, the Adam Eve special. Um, of course, created once again by Robert Kirkman, Corey Walker, and Ryan Otley. Uh, this episode was written by Helen Lee and Robert Kirkman himself um, as the origin story of uh, Adam Eve. Interestingly, and we mentioned it last week, uh, Helen Lee wrote season two, episode four of Invincible as well. So, uh, so got this Adam Eve special plus uh, the fin the mid season finale, as we're calling it, of season two. Um, the episode was directed by Haley Herrick. Uh, previously worked as a storyboard artist on Star Trek Prodigy and Blue Eyed Samurai, which has come out to great acclaim on uh, on Netflix oh, yeah. in the last couple of weeks. Uh, lots of people loving Blue Eyed Samurai. Yeah, it's on my uh, list of things to watch over the, the festive period. Um, because uh, it, it's just, as you said, it's coming out to great acclaim. Mm -hmm. Um, so looking forward to checking it out. Absolutely. But Chris, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the invincible Atom Eve special? Sure. 18 years ago, government scientist Dr. Elias Bradworth disobeys his superior, Stephen Erickson, and leaves with a dying pregnant woman named Polly, who gives birth to a powerful superhuman, 
Dr. Brandyworth swaps her child with the Wilkins' deceased newborn so that she can grow up in a normal family as Samantha Eve Wilkins. Growing up, Samantha proves highly knowledgeable about molecules and admitted to a school for scholars, but longed for a normal life. After discovering her transmutation powers, she scares off her only friend Val and is transferred back to public school for failing class. As she attempts to become a hero, she encounters a homeless Dr. Brandyworth, who reveals her origin as a government project and warns her not to use her powers. She later battles a group of deformed children that the government created amidst failed attempts of recreating her. After the children die, Erickson captures Eve along with Dr. Brandyworth and reveals he has Eve's mother Polly captured. He intends to use them to create even better weapons. In the ensuing fight, Erickson kills Dr. Brandyworth and Eve's mother. In rage, Eve overcomes the mental block that had prevented her from transmutating living material and erases Erickson's memory. She returns home to find her parents are upset that she has missed her own birthday party. She goes to her room and creates a photo of all the lost and dead people from Erickson's experiments. These are her real family, but she'll put up the Wilkins. Meanwhile, across town, Nolan Grayson hides his frustration that his son Mark is pretending to be duct tape man while he is waiting for his true powers to reveal themselves. Cut to season one of Invincible. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yes, of course, another uh, little post credit sequence there. Uh, as every single episode of season two has had a post credit sequence, uh, this one closes out with one as well. Yeah, and it was a good one. And it was a good episode. I'm gonna like yeah. let's just get into talking about it. I'm gonna kick us off with our usual points, our like top three points for the episode. And I'll start with the first one, which is really gonna be born into chaos. Mm-hmm. Like the birth, the secret origin, not of superhero Adam Eve, but of Samantha Eve. Mm-hmm. Like Wilkins. Because this was fun. This is really we get to see like like the 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 birth of one of the main characters mm-hmm. um it was interesting like it opens with the lizard league going against the guardians of the globe mm-hmm. and that's fun as well because again we're seeing uh, like the immortal like we hear of the reservist omni man you, you get to see the other ones who were only in one episode well majority were only in one episode yeah. of season 1 because they get the like they, they are no more by the end of the first episode. Absolutely. Yeah, we even get to see some of the original versions of uh, The Garden of the Globe, like the male Green Ghost. Um, we've had mention of the second Green Ghost in the last season, uh, who was married to one of the members of uh, of SOS, the uh, the Spouses of Superheroes uh, support group. Um, yep. But this is the original Green Ghost, so a different one as well. Yep, and we hear all about the like the the you the Red Rush, Darkwing, all like all the names that we've either seen or heard about throughout the the, the episode, mm-hmm. and it just kind of centers you back into the universe. For and again, if you're watching this special as your first kind of foray into the animated universe of that is Invincible, you're getting a good introduction to the type of kind of comedy, the type of some of the drama that goes on very quickly. Mm-hmm. Like the animation style, you get everything in fast order. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But great to see a, a, another moment with a, another completely different lineup for the Lizard League. Uh, this time, led by Queen Lizard and her son Prince Lizard, um, who are uh, also incompetent at leading the Lizard League, uh, just like every other version of the Lizard League has been. But they seem to be the main foes that we see pretty often going up against the Guardians of the Globe as well. Um, once again, uh, Queen Lizard, voiced by uh, Tatiana Maslany. Um, I think her fourth character this season of the show, <laughs> which is great. So uh, she must have been the booth for most of uh, most of the time during COVID, I guess. Yeah, what well, what else are you gonna do? Like a <laughs> bit of ADR on her uh, other superhero project, uh-huh. and then she just kind of rolls over and does this. It's great. Roll on, do this. Yeah, it was really really yeah. good fun. Uh, I like the little joke with uh, with Prince Lizard, where um, she says that she allowed him to uh, to do the explosion, but um, it created a lot more noise than she would have expected it to create. But that's okay. We can move along. Uh, did you notice there was a little uh, comment as well from uh, Doctor Brandyworth when we first meet him as he's uh, carrying Polly out from uh, out from the lab? Um, he says to her they were only supposed to cause a distraction. So he had planned this. He planned to get Polly out of the lab before the attack, which I thought was quite interesting. 
I thought this was fun. Like the introduction of Dr. Brandy Earth and kind of him explaining that, like, like kind of why are you trying to get rid, bring Polly away. And again, he's like, he is the doctor. He is like trying to steal away a patient. You're mm-hmm. kind of, you're left guessing what is happening throughout this. And it's only when you see Eve and then the Wilkins later on in the episode that you kind of start fully piece everything together and it kind of makes, oh, she's a weapon or at least an experiment, super kind of powered. Let's get her away. Um, which is a trope as well. Like we've seen this, the, 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 the child that must be kind of secreted away because it is a failed US experiment and its powers are too great. So you must hide it from itself and the world. Um, well, a successful experiment. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he regrets, the- he regrets his decision to work for the government and create this uh, very powerful weapon that they're going to use because he realizes that she is a child after all so um yeah. he wants to get her away from uh, away from the lab away from erickson um you know I, I just really like this because initially when you watch it you think that he's um just trying to protect polly take her take her away to the hospital and he's not going against the orders of erickson but you understand from that conversation that erickson doesn't doesn't matter what's going on he wants the child he wants the weapon back and then we learn later on exactly as you said chris that uh, he has done this because he sees uh, the child inside polly so um so i thought it was a, a really good opening really exciting opening great uh, great action uh, piece going on and, and cool to see the lizard league and the guardians of the globe at uh, at full power uh, to begin with uh, at least in in some kind of mission it was kind of uh, kind of cool to see because you didn't get to see the Gar- the original guardians of the globe like that very often no no, not at all. I will, hopefully we'll see more of them in part two of season two, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we probably won't see many of them in, the, no, in part two of season of, of season two. They're mostly dead, uh, unfortunately. Um, one other thing that I really liked in this, uh, as we have uh, Om- Omni-Man arriving, who is uh, being referred to as uh, the reservist because he wouldn't join the Guardians of the Globe. Uh, I like that he arrives with this for, for this uh, for the first showing of the outfit we all know him in. Um, and gives the explanation that the designer, who is Art, as we know from the show, uh, has told him that everybody's running around wearing um, letters on their uh, on their outfits. So he needed an upgrade, right? Uh, and then we get a little joke about uh, about Immortal looking down at his own suit and going, "Hang on a second, is that what I've got on my chest? A big eye, <laughs> <laughs> like that." Yeah. Well, it's better than a, a big symbol that stands for hope in a different language. Yeah. You know? <sighs> Superman slam. Oh. <laughs> is that all for you at this point? Uh, just the final uh, final moment, really, uh, as Eve is born uh, in the hospital um, and handed over to the Wilkins. Um, do you know what? I think this makes the Wilkins even worse. They thought they'd actually lost their daughter in tragic circumstances. You know, they're trying to um, comfort each other about the fact that they've lost their daughter. They are given Eve as a replacement for their lost daughter, and they still treat her as awfully as they do for the rest of their life of her life. You know, it actually makes it even worse because they knew the pain of not having a daughter, yet they still treat her as badly as they do. Yeah, I'll kind of spoil one of my feelings that came from this Adam Eve special, which is you really my I personally grew to dislike the Wilkins more because of this history Mm -hmm. because we you you kind of get to see the dark side the evil side not the evil the 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 shitty side of them in season one and partially so far in the the the, the season two definitely knowing this backstory knowing where this whole series goes Mm -hmm. this episode goes you're like no these are just bad people like they're just not nice and you could say emotional abuse, all those words, fancy words, but I just, do you know what? They're just downright terrible. They are. Like, that's it. Like, that's fl- plain and simple. They're just, like, there's, as you said, like, it makes it even worse knowing this. And as the episode goes on, you see more and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, oh no, you people should not have a kid. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of which, let's go on to our point number two, a bit more about uh, Eve growing up. This is the origin story of of uh, Samantha Eve Wilkins, of course. Um, so our point number two is growing up super um, because we get to see her powers develop over time as well. Um, I think this was really well told. I really enjoyed this. You know, the idea that even as she's a really young kid, unable to read, she's able to see 
chemistry in front of her in her mind. She doesn't have to read. She had all of this knowledge, all of these abilities without actually learning anything, without actually being taught anything. She's able to see the chemical composition of everything in front of her eyes. I think that's such a cool way to explain how her powers are starting to manifest really early. Yeah. And I love that scene with the babysitter. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it's fun when they come back, the, the parents come back and it's just an army of kind of sculptures, uh-huh. atomic sculptures everywhere. Um, because I like that, as you said, like she, she's a child that can see atomic structure everywhere. Yeah. And it's fun. It's really it's good. A, it's a unique way. And I think it helps even more so how excited her babysitter is because. You know, he's obviously likes chemistry. He's learning it. He understands it. He's he, well, not that well because he's letting a very young child help him uh, in his uh, in his upcoming test. But he's so excited by the fact that she's got this knowledge and this ability. But the reaction from her dad, of course, is, "Oh no, she's some kind of freak. This can't be possible." Uh, so he tries to push it back under the surface. Tries to, to make her live a quote unquote normal life. Um, doesn't want her to go to any kind of special school and make her stand out amongst everybody. else around them. I think there's even a moment when he says, oh, the neighbours are talking about about her. Oh, well, then we better send her to a special school. We don't want the neighbours talking about her, you know? Yeah, that's a... That's always a... Tr- like, personally, that's a trigger always for me. Like, in that, like, you in that you see that story being told in, in many different real-life situations of, like, oh, God, the the the, the, the neighbours, people are talking mm-hmm. about our son or our daughter in a weird way. They can't have that now. Yeah. Like, so, like, let's, let's sort the problem. Uh, and, again, that's an analogy or an analogue for LGBTQ, mm-hmm. for special needs, for you name it. They, they, like, we've seen those stories elsewhere. So you do see this as something that does happen in majority of the shows, but it's just also, I want to say the venom, but it's not the the disdain in Mister Wilkins as he starts talking with this going, Our daughter didn't do that. Don't talk about it like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the babysitter, to cut to when like Eve starts to lose her friends and tries to go to school and all that. Like again when she has these run-ins with her father, it is always very much, well, well, what are people going to think about us? Yeah. About you? Oh my God, that can't be a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All, and it always seems to come from, uh, the first one of those seems to matter much more. What are people going to say to say about us? Yeah. Or what? Or how are people going to judge us based on who you are, Eve? Why can't you be normal? Uh, even her mom says that to her. Uh, later on at, at, at one point but she is very solitary um she is going to her special school she gets to meet one friend val from across the road and we see that years pass uh, after this initial discovery of 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 samantha's powers but later they manifest in a different way she's able to change the composition of one of her school books after an argument which that she has with her mother she's able to turn it into uh, glass and then change it back afterwards so that's her first indication that suddenly she has these powers yeah which again is a cool, nice touch. Mm-hmm. It looked visually kind of interesting. Absolutely, yeah, it was cool. Again, like we've seen her kind of use her powers in the in the show uh-huh. in season one. So again, seeing this fledgling kind of creation of the powers as she starts to learn about her powers again, like even as she kind of later on then starts to go uh, fighting crime and she starts trying to learn about how to fly and things like that. And mm-hmm. It's almost like that Spider-Man film that we've seen hundreds of times where he learns to climb up the wall. Exactly. Yeah, when yeah. he finds himself sticking to the ceiling, when he web swings for the first time. Yeah. We've seen it a lot of times, that story. We've seen a lot of times that, that power adjustment creation mm-hmm. kind of episode mythos story. But it's told kind of in a unique Slightly new, new, unique way here. Absolutely, yeah. That, you know, I love the second thing that she does is turn her uh, her sandwich that her mother gave her into a hamburger. You know, why wouldn't you? If you're a teenager yeah. with these kind of powers, that would be the first thing you'd try. Let's test this out. Let's see, let's see how it goes. Uh, but then she shows off those powers to Val, uh, her best friend. And as we said, we've seen the two of them have been hanging out together for years. But when she shows them off to Val, Val's terrified of uh, what she's able to do calls her a freak herself and then never talks to her again. So 
again, driving a wedge for Samantha here, um, that she hasn't had uh, a good life becoming a superhero in this in this world. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, and it just kind of, we then kind of get to see that homemade suit mm-hmm. that she kind of makes that decision to be the superhero and smash cut to Dogpen, where the, these two guys are trying to steal like some puppies for someone who wants to experiment on a, a large number of animals. Mm-hmm. Which and this is fun. This is a like it's a, not the dog experimentation, I presume. Not the dog experiment. No, not at all. Oh. The, the 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 scene where we do have these two kind of hoodlums, mm-hmm. Nick, no good, no good nicks, and uh, <laughs> whatever way you want to call it. Right. Um, and it's this. The, it's that kind of like they're going against. They're trying to steal the puppies, and she kind of heroically stops them and stands in the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I enjoy it. it, it it's just a, a, it's a fun first excursion, if you want to call it that. Absolutely, and, and her turning the, uh, the the hoods that they're wearing over their head into uh, into metal, uh, so they fall to the ground and have to. You, you even hear them in the background dragging those metal hoods along the ground as they're trying to get away, uh, while she's having this conversation with uh, Doctor Brandyworth, who reappears. Um, so I thought that was a really a really fun, uh, you, as usual with this show, this little background nod to what's going on uh, behind uh, a big conversation. Uh, just having these uh, these two uh, crooks trying to get away with their metal he- heads now. Uh, a great little touch there. Yeah, definitely. And you, as you said, this is where we we get the Doctor Bransworth kind of somewhat discussion, and then um, her her nemesis, uh, Kill Cannon, is introduced for the first time. Yes, Kill Cannon, uh, who introduces himself as "My name's Kill Cannon," not gets beaten up by little girls, Cannon, and then proceeds to get beaten up by uh, by Adam Eve. A little girl, yeah, <laughs> of course. Of course, but I like that he's threaded in again, kind of like the Lizard League. I like that he's threaded in also uh, throughout her story uh, over and over again. We see this character appear, try and fight against her, and then she takes him out. Um, similarly to the Lizard League appearing and getting beaten up by uh, by the Guardian of the Globe. So uh, I like I like that they do it this way. Yeah, and it it it, it, it ro- rings true to the comic books where you have always have a rogue going against the hero who is consistently beat down and comes back in different ways. And you like, you have the vulture or like Rhino or the Riddler mm-hmm. or you named the, 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 the trapster, the captain boomerang really just like, you're like, why are you still doing this mm-hmm. years later? Uh, and this is, this, this is the, the, the inaugural, uh, beat down by little girl. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but good to have that in here uh, for for the episode. Uh, we mentioned Doctor Bradyworth and meeting up with uh, with Eve. Let's uh, let's talk about the final point. Our our final point for the episode being recaptured by Erickson because um, Doctor Bradyworth's been hiding out from the moment that Eve was handed over to the Wilkins uh, back thirteen years ago, I guess. Now at this stage, yeah, about that, I yeah. think. Uh, about 13, 14. So we learn a bit more about what Erickson has been doing during the time that. Um, Eve has been coming into her powers and developing her powers. Brandyworth has been hiding out, so he's decided that they do other experiments, trying to redevelop the kind of um, soup that he was trying to create. Um, so they've done four other experiments on four other kids, or f- created four other kids through these experiments, um, which we see initially in a battle with Eve uh, on the motorway. And they're kind of calling themselves Phase 2, 3, 4, and 5 as they battle against Eve, because... All they ever heard about as they were growing up, they'd come out of their tubes where they were being grown. Um, the doctors would experiment on them, see what their powers were, and then say they're not as good as Eve. So they've been laid out in front of them for their entire life that they're not as good as Eve and never will be, it seems. Ah, the youngest sim- syndrome. You're never going to be good as the oldest. Well, yeah. yeah. That's it. That's it. You're never going to make it up. <laughs> I, I make this joke because I am the oldest in my in my sibling. And because he knows I'm the youngest in my family. Yes. yes Thanks, exactly. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never make it. Anyway, uh, it, 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 this is, from an animatics and an animation point of view, this fight scene is fantastic. Really good, isn't it? 
as things are transmuted into different kind of metals or kind of things, and then seeing the the brothers, the siblings, different power sets mm-hmm. uh, as it happens, and the the different levels of failure that they are, mm. <laughs> gross failure, yeah. uh, and how how different they are from Eve yeah. uh, as uh, Phase One, Project One, um, and it is really well done because you. you- I definitely felt sorry for these kids as they're fighting with Eve. You know, the the, the way their powers are manifested, the way they um the way they look, even, you know, the melting yep. skin. Um, you know, the, there's one that hits a car and just melts on top of it and then kind of reforms, but it's not in that cool, sexy way like the T one thousand did in, in Terminator Two. It's just all these melted bones and skin forming back up to form something approximating a human shape. Um, And we hear from the eldest of these four experiments that he's the only one that can talk. The rest of them were never even out of their tubes long enough to learn how to talk. So there's a lot of sadness that's in there, you know, and as you hear Dr. Bradleyworth explain why he freed Eve and or freed Polly, Eve's mother, um, you kind of understand why he did, you know, this is how Eve would have been treated if she was left behind in, in that environment with, uh, evil Erickson. Yeah. Cause Erickson, to Erickson, they're not human. They're not, Mm -hmm. they're not people. They are things. Mm -hmm. They're weapons. Um, yeah. So, and that's how they are used. They are pointed in the direction to recover that their sibling to recover, uh, Eve and, bring her back in yeah um so they're point pointed in the right direction and fired um and they don't survive yeah um they now eve and eve is captured Mm -hmm. um at the end of the fight but it it, she still kind of gives us as hell of as hard as she gets in this first fight yeah but it, it also felt quite similar to an invincible fight uh where she is beaten quite heavily and if it really wasn't for Dr. Brandyworth intervening, they may have killed her or at least captured her themselves uh, at that stage, but she is uh, absolutely knocked unconscious before they all die. Um, so I thought that was quite a, quite interesting. Um, and then as they capture her and bring her back to the lab, along with Dr. Brandyworth, we see another massive reveal that Polly has also been taken back. Her mother, even though she died giving birth to Eve, was taken back to the lab by Erickson. Yeah, and that's where the siblings are coming from. Mm-hmm. Like they are kind of genetic clone, well, sibling clones type things, grown in the mother because Polly, as you said, like she, she was brought back. Mm-hmm. And again, it's just another reveal that does really just make you feel for Eve. Absolutely. And there's more that comes, but like again, just building upon building on this this child's remorse and the, her background being so distraught with just pain yeah. um, that she didn't even know about until like <laughs> as it happens kind of like we're getting some of the same reveals um, so it, it's just interesting and well and that does lead us to the next fight as well mm-hmm. where Polly is no more uh, and I'm not talking about the uh, the Monty Python par sketch mm-hmm. um <laughs> but it basically does then help unlock temporarily unlock Eve's kind of mental block because the the doctor did put a mental block in to to stop her from being able to change humans or animals or use, or not change but use her powers directly on humans and animals. Yeah, like they built in the subconscious block in order to so it's almost like a safety. Uh, on a gun exactly. type of thing. Yeah, he says that she's um, got endless possibilities, absolutely limitless possibilities, except for this one thing that he put in, this blocker that he put in. Um, I think they kind of revealed it a little bit earlier as she's trying to create a puppy out of uh, thin air, <laughs> and she can't yeah. do that. Uh, but she also can't just change the physical attributes of another human around her or, uh, or, or change another animal because he thought that was a step too far. But... Once he gets killed, once Polly dies, Eve's able to unlock that ability and effectively wipes the mind of Erickson and wipes the mind of all the government agents that had done the experiments effectively. So that's why she's in the clear. That's why when we meet her so many years later, the government aren't still after her because she's wiped their minds. Yeah. 
Um, it does mean one thing from very earlier in the episode as well. Mm-hmm. That was not a hamburger. That was a bean burger. Okay. Because she can't create animals. Right. She can't change animal composition. Good point, Chris. A hamburger is ham. Well, it's not, it's beef, yeah. but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bean burger. Burger. Very there good. There you go. Just that. The, I, I thought that was fun because you're just like, it was one of those ones where I was like, I could see like people like, like automatically pull up their like glasses on their nose. Excuse me. Excuse me. Earlier we saw her make a hamburger <laughs> and that can't, that's not canonically correct. I'm like, it is. If it wasn't a hamburger. Very good. There's also, I can't believe it's not real burger or impossible burger, <laughs> mm-hmm. or it's not burger, it's it, it's bean. Or There's many. There's tofu. Have you tried a tofu burger? No, I haven't because it's probably disgusting, but she could like it. It could be a tofu burger. I will get off my high horse about this burger right now. But a great catch, Chris. I like it. Thank you. I like it. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, we see Eve going back effectively after the death of every single person here that she knows um so in her mind she's just lost a mother that she never knew before four brothers i guess or four other family members that she yep. didn't know she had the doctor that created her who's technically her father uh, all of them are gone and learned that the wilkins are not her true parents um and calling back to another moment earlier on in the episode where they had missed her birthday. They didn't know even even know what date her birthday was. Dr. Brandyworth was the only one that did. She comes home and finds out this year they did actually remember her birthday, um, that they're there waiting for her to come home with her birthday cake, um, well, having eaten some of it because they're still horrible, horrible people, and send her to her room effectively. Um, but I just think this is such a melancholy moment to end the episode on, and it's it's really sad how it's done, really well presented, where we see her take a photograph down we hear her father say uh, wish that she was uh, that she was normal as well and she changes the photograph of the wilkins to this other true family of hers from the lab effectively all restored to their original what they would have looked like uh, before all the experimentation yeah it's it's an emotional moment where you like it kind of sets her as she's able to deal with the wilkins cuz she now has this memory of her real "Quote unquote real family, her 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 siblings and her her mum and dad." Yeah, and all she wants is a hug. All she wants is someone to love her, and I, effectively, she has to turn to Mrs. Wilkins, her mother, to for that hug that she needs because there's nobody else in her life. It's really just an acceptance of the position that she's in. She has to turn to these people because they're the only people in her life, and it kind of explains why. So many years later, as we're watching season two of the show, she's leaving home. She's getting out of there. She's running away from them. And now at the end of season two, episode four, she's had to go back to them once again because things haven't panned out uh, for her. So Eve doesn't have a great life, really. No, no. If only someone could sweep her away and to look after her. Exactly. One th- little thing I, I did like about the choice they made with her mum and dad is they ve- and any Harry Potter fans might... Might catch a nod there. They did make them look like the Dudleys. The, the, the Harry's auntie and uncle. I can see that. Were horrible to him. They, they very much gave him like the Vernon mustache. Mm-hmm. Like they, they kind of, and again, it, it, it's a bit of also trope giving him the shirt that looks like Al Bundy, <laughs> the dad. It, like there's a few kind of subconscious nods to the character styling that they give you so that you just straight away go, I don't like this person. And you're not supposed to like this person, so it's perfect. Not at all. He's, uh, I think, even the Invincible account and putting him out as the true villain of uh, of the Invincible story is, uh, is her yeah. dad, Adam uh, Wilkins. So, yep, yeah. 100%. Good stuff. Uh, just to close out on the uh, on the post credit scene, just a note, uh, a note on that itself. Uh, because once again, we see a side of Nolan that the family is not seeing, even in this moment. We see his reaction to Mark prote- running around the house, as kids do, um, pretending to be a superhero. The big difference with Mark is that he knows his superpowers are coming. He knows his father is a superhero. So he knows he's eventually going to be getting superpowers. And here he is pretending to be a duct tape man, a funny joke in itself. Uh, and Debbie telling him he has to go up to, up to take a bath because it's going to hurt really bad when he takes all that duct tape off. But you see the reaction from Nolan where it's just this violent anger, just 
he's able to cover it up in front of all the rest of them, but we can see this anger coming through in him at what's happening with this family or maybe at what he has to do. Definitely more towards the family at this point, I feel. Mm. At this point, for me, it's the he's still very much in his teachings of the, the Vultramite Empire and mm-hmm. the traditions. So he's there on his mission, and it is still very much a mission at this point. Yeah, yeah. And that brings us to the end. Smash cut to Adam Eve title card and back to uh, season one, if you really wanted to, of uh, Invincible. So with all that said, do you have any other notes, Derek, that you'd like to talk through? I think that's it uh, for everything from, from this episode. Excellent stuff. Well, then I will throw the ball back to your court and ask you, Derek, do you defend this Adam Eve special episode of Invincible? I really like this. I really like the idea of having these single character episodes in the world of Invincible. Um, we do obviously get to see uh, Mark in here and we get to see Nolan in here, but this is truly a story of uh, Adam Eve, uh, a real good story about Samantha. It's got the same kind of emotion that we've seen from the series, um, a good character development here. I'm hoping we'll get some more of these about other characters within this universe. We mentioned the current Guardians of the Globe have only been on screen for about 10 minutes of this half of the season. So maybe we could do a, a side story with just them on their own, you know, uh, its own episode during at the end of maybe season two. That would be kind of cool. Um, but I like Adam Eve as a character. I like learning more about her, but it is really tragic. It's a really tragic story that she gets. So uh, I'm hoping in the future she's got some good times ahead of her because uh, it seems like everything's been bad so far. Yeah, no, <laughs> it has, and it will only get worse. Well, we know it will get somewhat worse, but hopefully in the future, 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 it will get better. But not this episode, though. This episode was no. great. It was a really good yes. episode, uh, but yes. of, of a really bad time in Adam, the, Adam Eve's life. Uh, how about yourself, Chris? What did you think of this episode? I loved it. I loved it as a like a, a kind of origin, kind of literally what it was, which was like a kind of spin out comic, it's one one shot, mm-hmm. as I called it earlier. Um, that's it's fun. It, it helps give greater depth to the character of Adam Eve. It help and her support her supporting characters, if you will, mm-hmm. um, of who who they are, um, and it it's doesn't overstay its welcome. It's punchy. It's to the point, like some places might have done this as like a 90 minute or like, but like, again, you don't need to do it. Like it was just, they, you can also see that this was also done around the same time as season two, the animations off They're like fantastic. I didn't call out any of the, the audio or kind of any of the music, but some of like the choices were just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Not on the same level as kind of say like, Radiohead on the, in season two, but still like poignant moments are given the time to breathe. So hot tip to the writer, hot tip to the director, everyone working on this special and season two, just fantastic. Like keep doing what you're doing. It, it It's only going to get better as you get better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great to know that we have uh, have season three on the way as well uh, after yeah. the second half of season two. Uh, but first, we do have some feedback in on this episode. Uh, we've got an email in from Coffee and Vodka who says, Greetings, fellow chemically creative defenders. Gave this a rewatch feeling more than a little itchy. Her parents ripped from Harry Potter, but with a contemporary layer of being believably horrible are never fun revisits. Please tell me they had a building fall on them in the Kirkman comics so that I might look forward to them in the series. Well written, acted and animated with all the usual feels. There seems to be something off for their character, like since the beginning, the creators didn't know where and how to place her. Maybe it's miraculous power set or her altruistic traits in an otherwise cruel world. But the only time we've ever seen her completely at peace is when she's doing her own thing or hanging out alone in her treehouse. A question for Professor Chris. Does this ever change for her, or does she remain a square peg hero in a round hole world? Her other family situation was unbelievably even more tragic than her homebound one. The fight sequence was fantastically animated, exciting, sad, and gross all at once. The standout element for me, however, was hearing Lance Riddick. Even playing a villain, he was always a welcome presence in everything I'd seen or heard him in, and is very much missed. Finally, the only real flaw was her brother recognising Brandyworth, whom he'd heard of but had never met. 
otherwise a great special episode. Four garbage pale siblings, dumpster diving, low evolutionaries and pathetic parents out of five. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka, especially for the uh, additional accolades that, you, from an academic perspective that you have anointed me with. <laughs> um, I will take Professor Jones. Um, but you've never taught, Chris. I, I've taught people in the hard knock school of life, in lessons in the streets. Yeah, but just like Dr. Seismic, you're going to have to just keep a, a, a doctorate if you've earned one of those. I don't think you have, though. So I, I have. <laughs> but a professor of comic books, Chris. Um, yes. Without much spoilers, what would you say about uh, about where the character of Atom Eve goes? Does she just continue to get beaten down, or are there better things to come? Much like everything that Robert Kirkman does, major characters get major wins, while also suffering from major st- Shakespearean tragedy. Right. Yeah. That's the best way I can put it. Like without spoiling things, it's like things get better, things get worse. Of course. It's life. That's life. Kirkman does very much human stories set in fantastical settings, mm-hmm. zombies, in, in in superheroes. He does. He writes his characters well. He writes them believable. So, in ways that like he, you're just writing a story of life. Things are going to get better. Things are going to get worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just the, the superheroic spin on that. And I, because it's going to take some amount of time for, um, the, like season two, the remainder of season two and all of season three mm-hmm. to come out. If you want to do read the comic books, like I think, I don't think it's going to spoil too much for people okay. uh, in that it's, you're going to, it's going to tell you what the story is you're going to see it a lot ahead of time but i think you'll also enjoy kind of watching it in animated form anyway um but that's just me if you want to remain completely spoiler free wait until they inevitably cancel it with the final season of like season five (laughs) and like we just like we're one season away from the epic finale and they would have got there because that's of course like hollywood well, let's let's hope Prime Video is better at that. Uh, Prime Video exactly. tend to be quite good, and and as as we've seen already, they're uh, they're renewing these seasons uh, years in advance. So hopefully, we've got a few more seasons of the show. Um, but I suppose one of the things about your question, the way you've put it there, Coffee and Vodka specifically, uh, you've said that you feel originally that the creators didn't know what to do with Adam Eve and Adam Eve, and that she doesn't currently fit within this cruel world and i think that's part of it i think they're taking tropes of a young teenage female superhero character and putting her in this world and seeing how she'd react in this world so so part of the reason maybe why she feels out of place here is because we haven't seen this before um kirkman has taken the tropes and flipped them um she does become more part of the world even from the bits that i've read of the comic books she does become more part of the world and more uh, useful and more centered within the world of uh, of Invincible as the story goes on. But yeah, at the moment, she is out of place because that's the character. Uh, she's not uh, Wonder Woman standing up front on her own central comic book, able to use her powers, everybody giving her plaudits and, and awards for being a great superhero. The whole point is she can't be that superhero because the world's just not like that. So, um, so I think she probably fits in more as the story goes on because you'll get to know the character better as well. So I think doing something like this as the Adam Eve special does help that, uh, for me definitely as well. Agreed. I agree with that. I agree with that um, analogy and kind of statement. I agree with that statement. <sighs> I should Sorry, stand, that's true. I stand behind Derek. Yes, you made you made you you asked me to be a professor, and I shall be a professor. <laughs> Fantastic stuff! Thanks so much, Coffee and Vodka, for your feedback. Yes, thank you so much, Coffee and Vodka, and inevitably that has come to the end of our episode with the end of our feedback section. So that is us done now for 2023. Yes, there's only about a month left in it, but we have finished part one of season two, as we we're calling it, the first four episodes of Invincible, Mm -hmm. and this Adam Eve special. We will be back at some point in 2024. We just don't know when, because they've just told us early 2024. So watch this space. Keep an eye on our socials. Mm -hmm. Head on over to Twitter, slash X, where where you can get us at TV Pod Industries. You can also head over to Facebook at facebook.com slash group slash TV Podcast Industries. 
or just make sure you subscribe to each and every good or bad podcast catcher where our show is and inevitably we will just pop up one day in your feeds when the next episode of Invincible Season 2 is out. Absolutely. Yeah, but that's not the only thing we're covering. Of course, on our main feed on TV Podcast Industries, uh, you can get access to lots of other stuff. On our main feed next week, we'll be wrapping up all of our pub quizzes uh, that we've done so far this year. Uh, well, second half of this year, let's say. There's four pub quizzes that we've got to close out. And then we'll be moving on to Marvel's What If Season 2 from December 22nd. Some more animated goodness coming in the rest of 2023, if you're subscribed to our TV podcast industries feed. But as Chris said, if you are just subscribed to the Boys and Invincible feed, we'll be back in 2024 with lots more Boys and Invincible goodness. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Yes, thank you so much. And keep watching, keep listening, and keep being invincible. Smash cut to the invincible. <laughs> Damn, it's audio only. Bye. Bye. <laughs>